This is a Packard Bell Multimedia 6600, a mid-range home computer sold by Packard Bell around the turn of the millennium, featuring a 600 megahertz Pentium 3 with 64 megs of RAM, 15 gigs of hard drive storage, and as proudly displayed by the sticker on the front, a 3D FX graphics card. Those are pretty ordinary specs, but what piqued my interest about this machine is that the 3D FX graphics are actually integrated on the motherboard. Yeah, I never knew that was a thing until I spotted this thing in an online auction. Unfortunately, it was sold as not working, so let's dive into this thing and see if it can be brought back to life, and if so, see what those onboard graphics are all about. Packard Bell are known for their uh, different case designs, and this one's no exception. Well, okay, it's not that different, but it looks kind of interesting. There isn't a single spot on the front panel that's not rounded, and it has this kind of flowy, wavy shape to it. Kind of looks like the hull of a boat or something. But still, aesthetically appealing in a late 90s kind of way. Then in the back, of course, is just a regular old boxy ADX tower. Nothing really special going on there, except no screws. Uh, wait a minute, how do you open this thing? Well, it turns out you have to take the front panel off with a light tug, and behind it hides the screws. Kind of backwards compared to most ADX case designs, but also neat to have no visible screws, I guess. You may notice that there are in fact three five and a quarter inch bays and one additional 3.5 inch bay in the case, but there's only room for one five and a quarter inch and a floppy on the front panel. Well, that's because there's a plastic shield covering up the other bays. You have to remove it if you want to install additional drives. Inside the case, we find a somewhat rare MSI 6168 motherboard based on the venerable 440BX chipset from Intel and featuring onboard Voodoo 3 2000 graphics. The Voodoo is accompanied by a dedicated 8 megs of SGRAM and is using the AGP bus, thus precluding a separate AGP slot. Taking a closer look at the motherboard itself, the first thing I noticed was some of the caps bulging and exuding their brown gooey poison. Fortunately, it didn't appear to have spilled out onto anything else, but yeah, this thing definitely needed a recap. So next I proceeded to dismount the board and take it out of the case. Before I began the soldering stuff, I removed the CPU and went over the board with an anti-static brush in order to get rid of some of the dust that had collected there over the years. Then I brought out the desoldering gun and went to work. Okay, so now that I had replaced the bad caps, it was time to test the board and see if it would show any signs of life. So I went and got the power supply. I was a little bit wary that the power supply might also not be entirely healthy. So before turning it on, I decided to open it up and have a look. And yeah, a quick look inside confirmed my suspicions. That dark spot close to that power transistor does not look good. At this point, I was fairly sure that this power supply was dead, but I decided to try and power it on anyway, just to see what would happen. Dead, yeah, thanks McCoy, I got that. So I had to find a different power supply. What about this one? Nope, leaky caps and caps all over the place here. Great. Oh well, let's see if it turns on anyway. Nope, the fan does a little death jerk, but that's about it. Okay, I had one final contender to try out. Alright, finally one that appeared to work, so I brought out the multimeter to check the voltages. 
3.3 volts was a little bit high, but not too far from spec. Negative 12 volts looked good. 5 volts looked good. Positive 12 volts looked good. Nice. All right. Now that I had managed to get a working power supply, I could finally see if the motherboard would be able to boot. So I put the CPU back in and the 64 megabyte RAM stick and the ATX power connector. Then I used these jumper wires to short the power on pins on the motherboard in order to turn it on. And holy hell, it actually worked. I'm delighted. Yep, so was I. Now I just had to clean the CPU, fan and heatsink before putting it all back together. So after I had put the board back in the case again and put about a bazillion screws back in, I booted the machine up and no keyboard detected? Ugh, what now? So I took the board out of the case again and after staring at it for a while, I realized that I had forgotten to replace one of the capacitors right next to the PS2 connector. So I figured it must have something to do with supplying power to the PS2 ports or something like that. All right, then, back to the soldering bench. And a quick test in a component tester confirmed that this capacitor was indeed bad. Then I put the thing back in the case again, feeling pretty confident that the problem would be solved. So I booted it up and... Oh! Yeah, I feel you, Pingu. At this point, I was pretty much out of ideas. I replaced the CMOS battery just because, I don't know, some motherboards can behave strangely with a dead battery, but no luck. So I took the board out again and stared at it for another while. And then I spotted something on the actual PS2 ports. Yeah, that doesn't look right. Looks like someone jammed something in there that's not supposed to go in there. Hmm. All right, I guess I have to replace the PS2 ports then. So I scavenged a similar double PS2 connector from a dead motherboard I had lying around, soldered it in, put the board back in the case yet again, fired it up, and this time it finally worked. All that was left to do now was to put the rest of the stuff back in and enjoy a working machine. I added a PCI network card, replacing the 56k modem that was originally in there. I also replaced the 64 megabyte RAM stick with two 128 megabyte sticks for a total of 256 megs, which should be plenty for games and programs of this era. I also had to replace the hard drive because... So I put in this newer 160 gig Hitachi drive instead. Then I installed good old Windows 98, set up drivers and stuff, and then the machine was finally ready to go. So, what about that onboard Voodoo 3 chip? Well, I ran some benchmarks and the results are not exactly overwhelming. It got 985 3D marks in 3D Mark 2000, which seems quite low for a Voodoo 3. I think a Voodoo 3 should score at least around 2000 marks paired with a similar CPU, but it's not entirely unexpected, considering that the chip is crippled by only 8 megs of memory compared to the 16 megs that a standalone Voodoo 3 wouldn't typically have. There may also be some driver issues in play here, because I've noticed some other weirdness and rendering glitches here and there. I'll just have to troubleshoot that later. Also, it's actually possible to upgrade the video memory to the full 16 megs. You just have to find the correct SD-RAM chips and replace the factory ones on the motherboard. K2's Retro Workshop here on YouTube made a great video detailing that exact procedure. And if I ever get a hold of the correct chips, I'm very tempted to try this myself. 
But putting limited video memory and potential driver issues aside, I feel like this machine ticks a lot of boxes for me as a late 90s gaming PC. It plays most 3D games I'm interested in pretty well for the most part, a few frame drops here and there, but nothing too bad. And pretty much all 2D games of this era will run perfectly fine on a Pentium 3. Even DOS games should work quite well, and since the motherboard has an ISA slot, I could always put an old Sunblaster 16 in there for optimal DOS compatibility. I also just find the whole integrated Voodoo 3 thing neat, even if it may be a compromise in terms of performance. It's a bit odd, but that's what this channel is all about. But that's pretty much it for now. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to the channel, and if you made it all the way to the end, you're awesome. Thanks so much for watching, take care, and see you next time.